Okay, good day class. So we are now on the last or second to the last chapter or that module for our quantitative na chemistry. So we already discussed uh, sa aton nga uh, or how to gather samples, di ba? Your different mga pat or mga plants to secure and also preserve all your samples. So now let us go sa aton nga mga na tests or mga procedures to uh, do or uh, to perform your quantitative analysis. So you have different methods used in your analytical and quantitative chemistry. So you have here an overview of your gravimetric method. So before I start, so here sa itong last nga two chapters, uh, you have here your mga link na mga words. Okay, so uh, if makita nyo sila nga blue, and if you can, if magka-hover in yung uh, mouse cursor, okay, it will uh, go or i-do on kamo sa link where there is the definition of that word, a more, uh, speed, mas broad, okay, mas broad nga explanation about sa iya. Uh -huh. So, as we discuss the chapter 7, we will be opening. So, muna yung tabo, that's why uh, nag uh, nag ano gid okay, because nasama daw nakta kun nadugayan uh, mga previous chapter ang nobra is revised na lang gid and wala na to nadula gid to so the last two chapters will have a links mga muni so at least uh, mga open kamo if you have internet connection so I have here the chemical analysis so overview anay so gravimetric okay overview of the gravimetric method gravimetric method is a method of quantitative or chemical analysis in which the constituent salt is converted into a substance of a known composition that can be separated from a sample and weight. Okay, the step commonly follows are sa dalo. Have your chemical analysis, yeah, definition. So, medyo mahina internet. Uh, wait lang. So, I, uh, I opened the link here sa itong chemical analysis. Here are analytical chemistry, okay, yung most common uh, material on earth, such as wood, coal, and also minerals or air, are mixture of any different distinct chemical substances. Each pure substance says, for your example, your oxygen, so ang yung water which composed of hydrogen, kag oxygen, has a characteristic set of properties that gives it chemical identity. Yung mga uh, mas broad pa, mga tanga, chemical analysis muna, in which the constituents, so what is a constituent so here, sa itong Miriam Dictionary, the meaning of your constituent, okay, so constituent, okay, is essential meaning of any of any, oh, this is a uh, definition sa yung term, if used as, ano, then you have one part or that forms something, sabihin and reactant here, so, uh, then sa itong nga step, sa itong nga grabe, metric analysis, you have here, you need to prepare a solution containing a known way of a sample. Then you have to separate the desired constituent, then weigh the edited constituent and computation, uh, computation of the amount of the particular nga, sample from the observed weighted nga, isolated substance. So you have here, what is the purpose for your gravimetric analysis? So your gravimetric analysis of a lab technique mass of the concentration of a substance your mass the chemicals that we are trying to quantify is something we call your analyte okay of many methods that may be employed for isolating the desired constituent from a sol uh, from a solution of a sample the most common is your precipitation okay what is precipitation okay that is form into a substance not soluble into a solution. Ibig sabihin, it's either it will make a uh, precipitation is ang kita nyo ng dumang galutaw or dumang solid ng mga particles. So that is your precipitates. Okay, so it is precipitation is the process. Now, a reagent is added that forms an insoluble compound okay, with, uh, with the desired constituent but will not precipitate other constituent of the sample. Ibig sabihin, ng mga reagent na i-add mo sa mga solution, okay, will bind, okay, will bind to your analyte that you are looking for, okay, and ignore yan ang mga interference, mga iban, nga, da, nga mga ions or uh, uh, men, uh, mineral sa mga solution, dira lang siya sa mga target. So, you have a specific nga mga uh, 
specific na mga chemicals that will combine with another nga analyze mo muna. So, you have the precipitation obtained in being separated by a filtration, okay? And then wash free to of your solubles and also impurities, then i-dry mo or ignite to remove water and away mo. Ibig sabihin ang imong filtration, okay? So, ang imong uh, mixture which is may precipitate na nga ng form, okay? I-filter mo. Then, ang mga filter paper, kung sa diin nasala ang tananda, yung mga precipitates, uh, other mga minerals da, okay? That is, uh, will be a way da yun sa imo nga uh, filter paper after mo na siya i-dry. Okay? Next. Okay, certain substances can be separated by virtue of their SC comfortability into gaseous compound as in determination of your carbonate and in mineral analysis. The sample is being treated by an acid or your carbon dioxide if it is involved as a gas. Okay, the gas is being absorbed on a way quant uh, quantity of uh, solid alkaline reagent and the amount of your carbon dioxide is determined from the gain in your way of your absorbent. Your electro deposition is used in order to separate mga metals, di ba? Bata, asay mong uh, solution, okay? Basi may bata na mga kumbang. So you have your metals uh, that can be plated out by passing an electric current through your solution in uh, of their salts. Now you have your copper in your alloy may be determined by this method as long as the sample is free from other nga metals. And also the plate out under the same condition. Errors are being made in your gravimetric nga analysis using relate to the purity of your isolated nga constituent. Okay, ibig sabihin, ang mga constituent or yung mga analyte is not 100% uh, nga uh, buo gid basi may mixture pa nasa sang iban pa nga uh, mas kanin yung mga analyte mismo is not 100% it is already a compound or may mix nyo sa sang iban pa nga analyte. Therefore, dira gagawa ang aton nga mga uh, gravimetric nga error. So, you have here uh, in general, the compounds that are being precipitated are insoluble and the negligible nga er uh, errors Results from your uh, from the incompetence of the precipitation obtain a precipitate that is 100% pure and it is exactly the composition presented by your chemical formula. Yes, however, considerably more difficult. All gravimetric methods are subject to some degree of error because of its difficulty. So you have here mga different types ng aton nga gravimetric method. So, there are four fundamental types of your gravimetric analysis. Your physical gravimetry, your thermogravimetry, your precipitative gravimetry analysis, and electrodeposition. Okay? This differ in the precipitation of preparation of your sample before weighing of your analyte. Your physical class, okay? Your physical gravimetry is the most common type used in the environmental engineering it involves the physical physical separation of classif and classified and classification of matter in environmental samples based on volatility and particle size for example you have suspension of solid then you have your thermogravimetry okay, your thermogravimetry samples are being heated up and changed into sample mass and recorded volatile solid analysis and it is an important example for this type of your gravimetric analysis. Next, as the name implies, okay, your precipitative, okay, nag-explain ako din na ano ang precipitation. So, precipitative gravity relies on the chemical precipitation of your analyte. It is the most important application of the, uh, application in the environmental field with is the analysis of your sulfide. Now, last nga type is your electrodeposition. Okay, it involves electrochemical reduction of your metal ions as at the cathode and stimulates the disposition of your ions in the cathode. Ibig sabihin ang ang ions, okay, metal ions kay makadto sa sa cathode, your cathodes are positive charge. Ibig sabihin the metals are metal ions are negative charge, di ba? Okay? makadto siya sa or ma-magnetize sa dito sa cathodes and the 
ions or mga disposition sa ions on your cathode. Now, your conservation of mass, okay? An accurate uh, gravimetric analysis requires the analytical uh, signals whether it is a mass or a change in a mass. Okay, it is proportional to the amount of your analyte in our sample. In a gravimetric method, this is proportional Lipti involves with the conservation of your mass. Ibig sabihin mo ay isang may matula. It is, uh, if the method relies on one or more chemical reaction, then we must know the stoichiometry of the reaction. Okay? In the an analysis of your PO3, okay, described uh, earlier for the example, we know that the each mole of your HG2Cl2 correspond with your mole of your PO3. If we remove the analyte from the matrix, then the separation of the selected for your analyte when determining the moisture content in bread. For example, we know that the mass for your water in the bread is different between the sample's final mass and its initial mass. So why is gravimetry very important? Okay, so gravimetry is uh, important except for the particulate nga gravimetry, which is the most trivial form of gravimetry. You probably will not use gravimetry after you complete the uh, subject because uh, it's implying yung did mo gidya, mga laboratory equipment, chemical reagents, mga manabit ko. Kag-isa pa, uh, sa machine na subong, okay, uh, hindi na gidya mga high volume sa yung mga uh, high volume sa mga reagent, high volume sa analyte, okay? Sa mga machine subong, okay? Uh, gamay lang na ang ginakuha nila for the sample, then reagent nila ara na sa isa ka machine. So, salpak mo na lang na yata na niya class. Lain ang, ang ginaubra sa school, kag lain ang ginaya, kung ara ka na sa ibang mga workplace or sa ibang work environment. So, you have here, let's na continue. So, when they, uh, so, why then we are familiar, uh, why then it is familiarity with your gravimetry still important? The answer is that gravimetry is one of many small number of definitive technique whose measurement requires only base SI unit or uh, standard international uh, unit such as the mass or the mole and also the definition or for your constants such as your Avogadro's number and also the mass of your carbon 12. Okay, ultimately, we must be able to trace the result of your of any analysis to a definitive technique, such as your gravimetry, that we can relate to the foundation physical properties. Although most analysts never use gravimetry to validate their result, they often verify an analytical method by analyzing a standard reference uh, material whose position is traceable to a definitive technique. Now, your precipitation gravimetry. Okay, in precipitation gravimetry, a unsoluble compound forms when we add a precipitating reagent or precipitant okay, to uh, a solution that contains our analyte. In most cases, the precipitate is the product of a simple metathesis reaction between the analyte and the precipitant. However, any reactant that generates a precipitate potentially can serve a gravimetric method. So you have here, uh, may link ni para sa aton nga uh, procedure sa aton gravimetric. So I will play here para at least uh, by sa aton nga uh, offline nga lecture.
My job is to make college easy because students have a lot of fun. Okay, so that concludes our to nga video sa to nga. Like college students. Wait, I'm class. Okay, yeah, so how to do wala ni siya sa to nga module but it is a gravimetric na procedure. Okay, so here is another example of a gravimetric analysis from YouTube. Okay, so here, uh, this one uses a solid na uh, analyte. So the first step in our gravimetric titration lab is we're going to mass out our salt, which could be either potassium or sodium carbonate. So I'm going to tear out and reach zero. Uh, the container here so that my weighing boat is now part of the scale and I'm going to just by chance pick B and we're going to put about two grams and it's really important to put about two grams you don't have to be two grams exactly but certainly you need to be close okay so I got 0.46 and I'll have to spend five minutes trying to get two grams and the reason that around two grams is I've already done the mathematics here and the limiting reagent that I want to be I want the salt to be limiting not the precipitating ion all right so I want to add about two grams and that's about good enough so 1.96 is going to be the grams of the salt and I'm writing down salt B in my lab book or my write-up so that I know that I'm dealing with P and we can check for at the end or the teacher can check for the end. That's me. The accuracy of results. So now we're going to now pre-dissolve this so that all of the sodium and all of or the potassium ions okay, dissociate from the carbonate ion. Again, the carbonate ion is our friend here. So our next step is to dissolve our metal carbonate, our group 1 ion metal carbonate, and make sure that we get all of our ions completely dissociated. Now I'm going to force some distilled water into the beaker, and I'm adding about 200 milliliters. Okay? Now, I'm not measuring it because which is moles per liter is not important here. So I'm just using an estimate about 200 milliliters. Now normally we don't measure volume with a speaker because it is not a precise enough instrument. These markings on the side are just estimates, but I could just use that as an estimate in this case because, again, the molarity is not important. What volume I use is not important as long as I do what? Dissolve all of my salt here into dissociated ions. Specifically, I want those carbonate ions, right? That metal carbonate, there's one carbonate ion per two of those ions, whether it's going to be the sodium or the potassium. Remember, the purpose of this lab is to figure out which one you have. So I want to find out the moles of my precipitate. So we're going to precipitate out the carbonate ions. So we've got to make sure that all of the carbonate ions are associated. So now I'm just going to add them here. And with a stirring rod, I'm going to stir. And as we can see from our solubility rules, right now we see that solid at the bottom here because, well, the light is hitting this large crystal and essentially reflecting back to our eyes. But as we stir, we can see that the water is competing for that crystal ion or the ion stuck in that crystal and the water is able to get in there with its partial positive and partial negative charges and pull away the group one ions from the carbonate and it's going to look clear in a second once it dissolves because light when it hits the small associated ions
ions, those ions are actually smaller than the wavelength of light, and therefore light kind of travels right through. So light kind of, the size of its wavelength really determines what you can see from it. So in this case, we don't see any of the solvent once it dissolves. Because the size of the individual ions, carbonate and or sodium or potassium, is now to make the is too small compared to the size of the wavelength of light, those photons. So light travels through. And now we have a scenario where all of our ions, okay, have been dissolved. And our data is locked in this solution now. Really what we're after again is the carbonate ion. Right. So the next piece of this is now to make the precipitate happen. I'm leaving my, my uh, stirring rod in here because that's essentially what? That's where my data is, okay, the carbonate ion. All right, so now I'm going to add the calcium chloride. You know it's also very soluble, so this solution of calcium chloride is where I'm going to add the calcium ions, and the calcium plus two ions are going to now attract the carbonate negative two ions in the solution, and we're going to make a precipitate because, again, knowing Coulomb's law, the high magnitude of the carbonate ions, negative two, with the high magnitude of the calcium ions plus two, will stick together, and water will be able to compete with those charges, and therefore they'll make a crystal and a precipitate. But I have to add so enough calcium chloride to drive the reaction to completion. That's really important that I do that. So therefore, I have to have more than enough calcium chloride. So I've done the math already. Uh, need for about two grams of the salt. Need about 125. So again, I'm going to use a graduate cylinder this time to make sure I have at least 125 milliliters. And again. I don't have to be so concerned with the measurement because this is my excess chemical. As long as I have about 125, this is 100. A little more than 100. And again, I don't have to be totally uh, precise with my measurement as long as I'm over that 100. And this will be 125. So this will give me excess amount. And I have about 130. I'm just making sure that I have more than enough, it's my excess chemical. Remember, the amount of grams of my what? Initial salt, that was my living reach. I'm trying to make sure that all of this, all of the grams that I started with, okay, get, okay, dissolve, and I have more than enough calcium ions to react to all the carbonate ions that came from the metal one carbonate. So without further frost, let's get the chili out, we're going to add this together and make our precipitate. So let's do that. So I'm going to pour this here, and we can see the precipitate resulting. Again, I'm adding more than enough of my calcium plus two, and again, the calcium chloride is not something that I need to worry about being an exact amount. It's not about a molarity. It's really about uh, having more than enough calcium ions. So my volume here really isn't all that important. So now what I'm going to do is, now that we've created this crystal structure of the calcium carbonate, I know that because light doesn't pass through. Remember, light is a short wavelength. It's hitting a deep crystal structure, so it's bouncing back to our eyes, and that's clear that we made a precipitate. Okay, light could travel through the Tyndall effect. We know something else is going on. So we're going to let this settle. And as it settles, and again, I'm leaving my stirring rod here. As it settles, my data is in here, and I want to collect all the mass of this carbonate somehow and be able to figure out how many grams of, an, of the calcium carbonate I have, which essentially is chalk, and basically convert that to moles, and the number of moles of my carbonate is the moles of my metal carbonate. It's beautiful. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. So my data is in the precipitate. So we're going to let this sit for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to filter this out. So right now, we're going to mass out our filter paper that we're going to use to uh, collect the precipitate that has all the information we need to answer. So I'll put my filter paper on here, and I'm getting 0.40 grams. And 
what I would do is I'd make sure that I put my name on the filter of paper first before I do this, because that could add to the mass. And this is our dry piece of paper. It's a really important piece of information. Because when we collect our precipitate, when we filter this out, we're going to need to know uh, what precipitate is on to subtract off once we dry out our precipitate. So we've done that very successfully. And now we're going to filter out our uh, precipitate of the water. I'm going to place my mask down and build the paper, and if you don't do this part, you're going to essentially do the lab here, so I'm going to the paper into my viewer funnel. I'm going to use an aspirator here to help me um, filter out the precipitate now that's kind of basically collecting on the bottom. And uh, I'm going to turn on my water, which is going to create a partial vacuum. And this is an important step here. Um, what I'm going to do is just pour a little bit of my precipitate. Very important to do this. A little bit of my precipitate in the middle. You don't want to just pour a lot at the beginning because some of the precipitate could pour around the outside. So just a little bit. Okay, so that I can just kind of seal the precipitate, the, the water, or the um, um, seal that uh, filter paper, and have it seated nicely to the bottom of the paper front. Okay, now I'm going to pour very slowly. Again, I'm trying not to uh, spill any of my data. Remember, all my data is in the what? Is in the precipitate. And now we may have a nice scenario where we're filtering ice for the first time, but there can be scenarios where uh, you may need to do this a couple of times. All right, by looking at the color of the filtering, it's like I have some ions at the bottom of there. All right, so I may have poured too much. But using that aspirator and partial vacuum I'm creating, I'm collecting all of my calcium carbonate, which essentially is chalk. Okay. And it looks a little cloudy, so I'll do this probably a couple times. See what I'm doing here. And again, very important to try to get all the precipitate out of your beaker. And onto the filter paper. Again, my filtrate's a little bit cloudy, so I'm going to have to do this one more time. And you can see there is a white substance being collected on the filter paper. And when I go slow, I'm not being as you can see in my beaker. Slow as that should be. I'll make sure I can't leave that. Bottom of my beaker. All that solid comes out, I don't want to leave it behind. Remember, every mole of carbonate is a mole of my metal carbonate, so it's very important that we get all the ions, all the um, crystals, ion out. As you can see in my beaker, I've got some solid left behind, I can't leave that. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, one this, it's done filtering. I'm going to stop the water, pour that filtrate back into the beaker, and do this again. And I'll keep doing this until I get a nice clean filtrate, or I'm satisfied that I got all of the possible ions and possible, all the ions, or all the crystal precipitate as possible. So I'll do this again. Be careful, every little drip is a piece of data. Okay. And I'm going to pour this back in a little bit. And again, you've got to do this a couple times, as many times as it is necessary. Make sure when you put your pupner funnel back on, it's nice and tight. You're creating a partial vacuum, so if this is not on tight, okay, you're going to have some issues regarding the uh, vacuum that you're trying to create. All right, so as you can see, this is a lot lighter than the first time, and that's the problem. Uh, purpose here. 
Okay, so why am I using vacuum filtration? Well, because this is a cold solution. It would take a long time to filter to a regular laboratory setup. And I can see that my filtrate is much cleaner the second time around. Okay, so that's the process. I keep going, keep cleaning this out. You may want to use holy rubber policeman to help you push out the solids. All right, so this is the rubber policeman. So as you pour, you want to push out the solids here. Okay, and again, it's pretty self-explanatory that we're going to finish this. All right, so we'll keep doing this until it's clear. And it looks like my second filtration is coming out nice and clear. So again, if I'm just persistent enough, slow enough, all right, I can get myself a nice precipitate collector. So I can see my filtrate pretty clear, clear enough. I'm happy that I've got almost all of the precipitates out stuck on and collected on my filter paper that I've already masked out. And I've got all of my precipitates out in the case. And I'm dissatisfied that I have, and I can always use a wash bottle to clean out the sides. Right. Use a wash bottle, clean out the sides, just keep filtrating. We'll take some of this filtrate out and keep going. In this case, I'm done. So the next step is I'm going to stop my water. And now I'm going to take my filter paper out. As remember, I'm going to use a wash glass. This is what's going to go into the oven. It's already set. Okay. And I'm going to basically collect my filter paper. So, like I'm trying to flip a. Um, uh, a waffle or let's say a uh, omelet I'm just going to grab the edges of my it'd probably be helpful to to take your filter paper off so that you don't have the pressure scenario and all i'm going to do is very simply like i'm taking flipping a, a uh, I'm just going to grab the sides of this the best that I can to pull up this filter paper. Try not to touch the surface too much. I'm going to place that onto a... I do have some, a little bit of my data on here, so I'm trying to scrape that off. But I'm going to put this on a watch glass that I should also have my initials on in my lab group and this is going to go into my um, oven and this is what we're going to come back tomorrow and mass out tomorrow subtract out the dry filter paper and now we can get the mass of our precipitate <clears throat> so now you already saw the procedural of your gravimetric uh, uh, technique so we have here the theory and also the practice that all precipitation gravimetric analysis shares two important attributes. First, the precipitate must be of a low solubility and of high purity. And of the known composition, if its mass is reflect accurately, the analyte's mass. Okay. Second is if it must be to separate if must be easy to separate the precipitate from your reaction nga mixture. Ibig sabihin, pwede lang siya nga ma, or mag, ano, sa, mahapos lang sa gamiton if you use your precipita uh, precipitation vapor. Filter paper. Tanan nga precipitate mo mapabilin lang sa yung mga filter paper. Now, next, uh, let us proceed to the next analytical, uh, quantitative or analytical uh, method which is your titration. So your titration yung class, okay, is a slowly addition of one solution of a known concentration called your titrant to a known volume of solution that uh, of an unknown, so, unknown concentration until the reaction reach your neutralization which is often indicate your color change. Okay, the solution called the titrant must uh, satisfy the necessary requirement to be a primary or secondary standard. In a broad sense, titration is a technique to determine the concentration of an unknown nga solution. So there is like a proportionality. Okay? Terms you will need to be familiar with in order to understand the discussions of titration. 
You have your titration. Okay, your titration is a technique used to measure the volume of a solution with using a known concentration that is required to react with the measured amount or yang mass or if you are using volume of an unknown substance in a solution. Then you have your burette. Okay, a burette class is an instrument you uh, to measure a volume and you have a graduated glass tube okay, about 40 centimeters long okay, with a uh, stop cup okay, on the end. Nga man. Kodo mo na yung mga valve to open or close it para uh, makontrol mo ang amount sang volume nga ga pass through. Next is uh, the volume of the measurement is made by re uh, reading the fluid level in the bu uh, in the burette okay, before kag after matapos or sa imong titrant then the fluid in the burette is dispensed through the stop cup then for your standard na solution okay, a solution of unknown concentration then for your unknown okay, it is a substance of a, or a mixture about which something is not known. Then your indicator, okay, is a substance which is added to the reaction system in small amounts. It indicates that the reaction is complete. Kung my indicator or ang change in color. Then you have your endpoint, okay. It is the stage of your titration at which the indicator change color is being observed and indicating that the reaction is now complete. Now you have your introduction of uh, to titration and types of your titration. First of all, titration is important part of the study of chemistry. Furthermore, there are four important types of your titration. It must uh, for a quantitative chemistry laboratory experiment. Okay, understanding the titration and type of your titration. Okay, uh, titration is a procedure that takes place in a lab. Furthermore, this procedure uses a solution of unknown concentration in order to determine the concentration of your unknown. Moreover, this is accomplished by putting one of the solution in a flask and filling the burette up with another solution. Also, ang stop clock on your burette allows one to slowly add one solution to the other until the reaction reaches an end point. The conclusion uh, of your reaction, typically the titrant, okay, for example, is the known solution is being added from your burette to a known quantity of analyte. Okay, the unknown solution until there is a reaction or your change in color. Now, knowing the volume of your titrant added allows the finding of the concentration of your unknown to take place. Generally, we use an indicator to usually signal the end of reaction. Okay, so let me look up for uh, mga video or sa ato nga, titration. Okay, so sa dalawang sang uh, after tani, okay, there is a video prepared na para tanawan niya. So, you have here the acid-based nga titration. So, mga different types ng titration. Okay, this type is certainly very important among the type of your titrations. Okay, the strength of your acid can be used, uh, found using the standard solution of your base and it is called your acidimetry. Similarly, one can find the strength of the base with the help of a standard solution of an acid, which is a known alkymetry. Okay, you have acidimetry and alkalimetry. Napakalain, okay? Acidimetry, okay, it is the strength of your acid, okay, using your standard solution of some base. For your alkalimetry, okay, you are looking for the strength of your base okay the base is for your alkalimetry or alkaline and the strength for your acids is your acidimetry so the name itself pa lang is for your acid and for your base it is alkaline or alkalimetry now both titration uh, certainly play a role for your neutralizing of your alkali or your base furthermore in an acid based titration one of the solution is an acid and the other one is base. Moreover, one is placed in a flask and the other is placed in a burette, okay, from which it is 
drip into a flask until titration reach its end point. So you have here an example. You have your HA and so BOH. Your HA, H, uh, basta kung ang H siya class, una sa uh, imong uh, chemical or sa imong formula name, A, it signifies that it is acidic. Then, for, kung may makita na mukhang mga OH, okay, it means it is alkali. So, you have here, ang ilang ilang product is BA and H2O. So, you have here, acid alkali that will produce into a salt water. Okay, or H plus plus A plus B plus OH is equals to B plus A plus H2O. Okay, this is an example. Okay, the, this titration is based on the reaction of your neutralization because a base or your an acid and, and and your analyte, furthermore, in this type, a reagent is being mixed with a sample solution until it reaches the required pH level. This type of your titration majorly depends on the trap change in your pH or your pH meter. Now, for your redox titration, and one can call this titration an oxidation reduction reaction. Okay, in this titration, the chemical reaction takes place with the transfer of electrons in the reacting ions of an aqueous solution. In a redox titration, one solution is reducing agent and the other one is a oxidizing agent. Agent. For example, some of your example of this titration is your fat as sa the lobe. Okay, your permanganate titration. Okay, the use of potassium permanganate as, as an oxidizing agent, its maintenance takes place with the use of your dilute sulfuric acid. So you have here your potassium permanganate, your potassium. Mn, man, uh, manginate, potassium permanganate. So, then you have here your sulfuric acid. Okay, so HSO4. Okay, makombine sila, it will produce K2SO4 plus 2MNSO4 plus 3H2 plus 5O. Or, kung isulat mo siya, this is another writing niya. Okay, MnO4 plus 8H plus 5E equals to Mn2 plus and 4H2O. This solution, <coughs> this solution remains colorless because the end, because of the end point. Moreover, the potassium permanganate is used to estimate your oxal uh, oxalic acid uh, ferrous salt, hydrogen peroxide, and oxalates, and many other. Your dichromate titration, niya class, okay, these are the uh, certainly used potassium dichromate as your oxidizing agent and also acidic medium. Moreover, the maintenance of the acidic medium takes place by the use of a diluted sulfuric acid. You have here your equation, chemical equation, K2R2O7 plus 4H2SO4 will combine and produce the product of K2R2SO4 and it will produce your byproduct which is water H2O and oxygen. I can simply write as K2O27 uh, plus 14H plus 6E produce into Cr37H2O. Then you have your iodometric and iod, uh, iodomic okay, na titration. Okay, furthermore, these titrations, the reduction of your free iodine to iodide ions and also oxidation of your iodine ions to free occurs. Okay, you have your your I2 and your two electrons. Okay? It will uh, reduction since you will be gaining electrons. Okay? Ibig sabihin, magiging negative charge sa, so it is reduction.
A then you have two uh, negative uh, iodine na yan, negative na sign. So uh, you will gain two electrons. So it is oxidation. So your next is your precipitation titration. Okay, the basis of this titration is the precipitate formation. We bring two reacting substances into contact in precipitation titration. For example, you use the solution of a silver nitrate takes place through the solution of your ammonium thiocyanate or your sodium uh, chloride. This react forms a white precipitate or your white thiocyanide or silver chloride. Okay, for your silver, it is AJ. AGNO3 or for your silver nitrate. Then for your uh, ammonium uh, thionite, uh, thionite or gamut, yeah, and it is your sodium chloride. Okay? It's, kung hindi ka sodium chloride, it, pwede man ang thiocinate, nga, ammonium thiocinate, ammonium NH4, CNS is your thiocinate. So, it will produce uh, sil uh, silver chloride plus NO3 or your sodium <coughs> sodium nitrate. Then, sa dalom, you have your uh, silver thiocinate, uh, thiocyanide and plus your uh, nit uh, nitrate. Ano saan? Ang gas. Una yun, ganyan. Uh, ammonium na eh. It is your ammonium nitrate. Okay. Now, for your complex nga metric or complexometric titration, okay, in this titration, most importantly, the formation of your undissociated complex takes place. Furthermore, it is more than precipitation titration. Okay, you have here Hg, your mercury, 2 plus plus 2 Cs N okay, will produce into a Cs and produce Hg S N two. Then you have your Ag. Ag is silver plus two Cn negative. So dua ka two. So it will form into Ag Cn two. Now ethylene di uh, aminoacetic acid or your EDTA is certainly important reagent that forms complexes with mga metals. Okay, the procedure for the following titration. First, you need to choose a titrant. Okay, titrant is very important para mabalan mo kung ano ang imo ano nga solution. Okay, dapat ang imo titrant is compatible with your unknown. Although wala ka kabalo kung pila ang amount sa imo nga titrant, you need to know nga compatible sila para my color change. And afterward, choose your titrate. Okay. Select the normality of your titrate. Furthermore, choose the volume of your liquid to be piped out. Then, moreover, select an indicator and you start your titration. One most, uh, must note that the endpoint of your color change of your solution from the final reading, now calculate the normality of your titrant using the equation events you have here. N1, V1, and N2, and V2. So, ang first, yeah, initial na volume, then sa last, yeah, okay, we have here, sa yung mga titrant, or sa yung mga ano. So, finally, over the fi uh, finding the correlation for your normality, calculate for the given substances in the whole uh, solution using the equation. So, it is the mass is equals to equivalent weight times normality times the volume divided by 100. So you have here more questions. Okay, what is the unknown quantity of a calculated after your calculation, uh, titration? Okay, when titrations are being performed using an unknown, the goal is to find what is the unknown. Okay, furthermore, the unknown quantity that we can calculate after the titration included okay, calculates the unknown concentration as well calculating the mass percentage of your unknown. Which will lead us nga importante ang titration. Okay, titration is an analytical technique that it is widely used in the food industry. It allows food manufacturers to determine the quantity of reactant in a sample. For, ex uh, for example, for example, 
it can be used to discover the amount of salt or sugar in the product of your concentration of your vitamin C on or sa yung mga vitamin E, which has an effect on a product color. Hence, titration can be used to analyze food ranging uh, from food product and even as a factor for food poisoning. That's why titration is very important kapina sa inyong uh, food technology. So you have here video sa aton nga uh, titration. A titration is a technique used to work out the concentration of an unknown solution when you know the concentration of another solution. You carefully add the known solution to the set volume of the unknown solution until the reaction is complete. This enables you to work out the concentration of the unknown solution. You may need to use the indicator to signal the end of the reaction. You can calculate the concentration of an acid or an alkali by carrying out a titration experiment. In this video, we're going to look at how to carry out titrations. In the next video, we will then look at the calculations to go with the experiment. The apparatus needed for titrations looks like this. The pipette is needed to accurately measure a certain volume of the unknown solution into the flask. The barrette is then used to accurately measure and add the unknown reactant to the unknown until the reaction is complete. The barrette can measure up to 0.05 cubic centimeters accuracy. To carry out the titration, you follow these steps. 1. Using the pipette, add a set volume of the unknown solution to a clean conical flask. 2. You may also need to add a few drops of indicator. 3. Fill the barrette with a known solution. 4. Record the starting volume of the barrette. 5. Slowly add the solution from the barrette to the unknown solution in the conical flask. You may need to swirl the flask to mix or use a stirrup. 7. Stop adding when the reaction is complete. The end point is reached. This is where an indicator may help because there would be an appropriate color change. 8. Record the final volume. 9. Subtract the final volume from the initial reading. This gives you the volume of the solution added. This volume is called the titrate. 10. For an accurate experiment, you should repeat this experiment a few times until you get consistent values for the titrate. Depending what indicator you use will depend if the color change is gradual or a sudden change. If you are carrying out an acid alkali titration, you may use a universal indicator which would give you gradual color change, whereas litmus would give you a sudden color change. Sometimes the acid may be the known solution and the alkali unknown, and other times the alkali the known and the acid unknown. So we've carried out the titration a few times and have a consistent titrate value. What do we do next? Titration calculations. Now that you know how to carry out titrations, watch the second part of this video to see how to do a titration calculation to work out the actual concentration of the unknown solution. All you really need to remember is that titrations are used to work out the concentration of an unknown solution when you know the concentration of another solution. PH is plotted against the volume of base okay, so, uh, so that is how you base, perform your titration. So next, our Satodo illustration lang to. So here is a uh, more example for our acid-based ka, titration. So from YouTube nga po, and also the link is our Sato nga module. We recognize the equivalence about titration by using some of the science 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 of the science
It's for like example, a kind of stoichiometry a solution of sodium on a titration curve for an acidic solution. The <laughs> pH is say plotted against the volume of base that is progressively added. With 25 As we add base, the, the pH slowly rises, it takes then sharply rises towards the equivalence, to point. the equivalence point. This is the point where precisely leaders, enough base has been added to neutralize the, the exact of the amount acid. of acid in solution. When we perform titrations, we recognize the equivalence point by using some called an Let's indicator. This is a substance that will turn a vivid color once the equivalence point has been reached. When we neutralize a strong acid with a strong base, the equivalence point will be 7. If either or both species are weak, this number will vary. For example, let's say there's a solution of sodium hydroxide and we want to know its concentration. Say we react with 3 molar sulfuric acid with 25 milliliters of the base. And we find that it Thanks takes 11.6 milliliters of acid to reach the equivalence point. If we convert to liters and then have conversion factors for the concentration of the acid and then the stoichiometric ratio, we can arrive at the concentration of the reactant. Let's check comprehension. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Okay, so ito na ito nga mga calculations sa titration. So, let us now proceed sa ito nga spectroscopy. So, spectroscopy okay, is a study of your absorption and also emission sa ito nga light and other radiation by a matter that involves the splitting of your light. Or more precisely, it is the electromagnetic radiation into the constituent nga wavelength or your spectrum, which is done in much the same way as a prism, a prism splits light into rainbow or color. Okay, in fact, all the spectroscopy was carried out using prism pa and photographic nga mga plates. So, bong modern nga spectroscopy. It uses diffraction, creating to disperse your light, and which is then projected into a CCDs or charge couple devices. Uh, similarly to those used uh, in digital camera, the 2D spectra are easily extracted from your digital format and manipulated to a 1D nga spectra that contains an impressive amount of useful data. Recently, the definition of your spectroscopy had been expanded and also includes a study of your interaction between particles such as your electrons, protons, and mga ions. As well, their interactions with other particles as functions for their collusions nga energy. Now, how do you use your spectroscopy? Okay, far from being specialized or unique field, Spectroscopy is an integral to a variety of disciplines. While it provides a theoretical backing to early quantum research in radiation and also atomic structure, it has also a staggering uh, number of your mga other applied uses like your magnetic resonance imaging, your X-ray machines that utilizes a form of radio frequency spectroscopy, we measure the unique makeup and also physical properties of distant astral bodies through their spectra and wavelength. And it is used to test doping in sports. Okay, ano naman doping in sports is this. Uh, it is using illegal substances to enhance your performance in sports. Now, the different types of your spectroscopy are distinguished by the type of rigia rejective energy involving in the interaction. In many applications, the spectrum is determined by measuring changes in the intensity or frequency of your radio, uh, radioactive energy. And the type of your spectroscopy can be distinguished by the nature of interaction between the energy and its material. 
For example, you have here your astronomical spectroscopy. Okay, this type of spectroscopy is chiefly concerned with the analysis of an object in your space because astronomical spectroscopy. For example, spectroscopic uh, analysis of your astronomical objects, we can measure the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation and determine its wavelength. It can tell us about the object's chemical composition as much as a factor of their spectral cadmium mass. Also, temperature, distance, kagang speed, using the function of the wavelength as the speed of light. Next is your absorption spectroscopy. Absorption spectroscopy involves the use of spectroscopic technique that measures the absorption of radiation in matter. We can determine the atomic makeup of valuable by testing for the absorption of specific elements across the electromagnetic nga spectrum. Then your biomedical spectroscopy, biochemi uh, biochemical, biomedical spectroscopy is the type of spectroscopy that uses biomedical science. For example, magnetic resonance spectroscopy or your MRI. Okay, a specialized technique associated with uh, imaging or MRI is often used to diagnose and study chemical changes in the brain that can cause anything from depression to physical tumors as well as analyze your metabolic structures of your muscle. This work of mapping spectrum or your wavelength in your brain that corresponds to the known spectrum and being carefully analyzing your pattern and also a vibration of those patterns. Next is your energy deprived X-ray spectroscopy. Okay, energy deprived X-ray uh, spectroscopy, otherwise known as your AEDS or EDX, is used for identification and quantification of elements found in a sample. This technique is used by the phenomenon Pro-X desktop SEM. Okay, also used for the conjunction of the transmission of electron microscopy or TEM and scanning transmission electron microscope to create specially resolved elemental, elemental analysis in areas of small of a few nanometers in diameter so it is a very very sm uh, small object so ang, ang thing is they are microscope okay they help us see microscopic nga mga objects next is your spectro uh, spectrometry okay your spectrometry is the measurement of the interaction between your light and also say mga matter and the action of your Reactions are being measured by your radiation intensity and your wavelength. Now, for your mass spectro uh, spectrometry is an example of a type of spectrometry, and it uses or measures the mass within your chemical sample through their mass to charge ratio. This is usually done by ionizing the particles with a sh uh, sh with a sh with, lako, with a shower of electrons then passing them through a magnetic field to separate them into different stages and deflections. Okay, once the particles are separated, they, they are being measured by an electron multiplier and we can identify the makeup of the sample through the way of each ions. Okay, typically, scanning electron microscope, uh, microscope uh, offers options of your spectroscopy or spectrometry based on this application. The practical use of your mass spectro spectronomy okay, includes isotope dating and also protein characterization, independent revolving space exploration robots such as your Mars uh, Phoenix lander also carries a mass spectrometers for analyzing your foreign nga mga soil, foreign, so mga foreign soil sang Mars. Then you have here history of our spectrometer. Okay, the study of spectrometry dates back at the year 1960s. 1960s and 60s, okay? When Isaac Newton first discovered that the focusing light through a glass split into different colors like your rainbow, known as your spectrum of visible light. The spectrum itself is an obvious visible phenomenon or phenomena. It makes up the color of your rainbow and creates a sheen you see on the surface of the 
paddle. But it took centuries for a piecemeal research to develop the study of this phenomenon into coherent field that could be showed to draw usable conclusions. Generations of work by your scientists, such as your William Hyde Watson, leads the discovery of your dark lines that were seemingly ran, uh, randomly placed among the spectrum. Eventually, it is determined that these were the after effect of the absorption of your chemical in the Earth's atmosphere. Okay? Simply put, the light or natural light filters from the celestial bodies in the space, such as your sun, is go, uh, it goes through uh, various reaction in our atmosphere. Each chemical element reacts slightly different in this process. Some are being visible. Those who are and uh, those who are in 390 to 700 millimeter now wavelength, okay, that are detectable to the human eye, and some visibly or invisible, like your infrared and also ultraviolet rays, which is outside sa nga, visible nga spectrum. Okay, as, as each atom corresponds to and can be represented by an individual spectra, we can use the analysis of your wavelength and also light spectrum to identify them, quantify your physical properties, and analyze your chemical chains and reactions from within their framework. Some practical ways to use your spectroscopy includes here, down below. Have here, we can use the unique spectra to identify the chemical makeup and also temperature and velocity of your uh, object in the space for the metabolite screening and analysis and also improving the structure of your drugs. For measuring sampled chemicals of nanoparticles through the mass to charge ratio using a mass spectrometer. Then you have here difference between a spectrometer and spectroscopy. Okay? The spectroscopy okay, is the science of studying the interaction between matter and radiated energy in the study of the absorption characteristic of your matter, also being absorbed behavior of your matter when the subjected to electromagnetic radiation. Then your spectroscopy doesn't generate any result. It's simply the theoretical approach to science. On the other hand, naman yung class, your spectrometry, okay, Spectrometry na gidya, okay, it is the method to acquire a quantitative measurement. It is metry. Okay, then scopy, okay, it is the science or study. Okay, ang spectrometry, it is now the method that acquires quantitative measurement of your spectrum. And it is the practical application where your results are being generated. Helping in the quantification of mga uh, results mo, mga examples, or mga sample then your absorbance, optical density, and also your transmittance. In short, spectroscopy is the theoretical science and spectrometry is the practical measurement or apply in the balancing of your matter in an atomic or molecular nga level. <coughs> now, let us proceed sa nga spectrometers. Okay, a spectrometer is an instrument that used uh, to measure your variation of physical characteristics over a given range. Okay, ang imo range is what you call your spectrum or ang imo nga uh, wavelength. Okay, this could be a mass to charge ratio spectrum in a mass spectrometer or a variation of your nuclear resonance frequency in a nuclear magnetic resonance machine or NMR or spectrometer or to change the absorption and emission of light with a wavelength in an optical spectrometer. A, you have a defined as lag isa isa. The mass spectrometer, okay, NMR spectrometer, and the optical uh, spectrometer are the three most common types of uh, spectrometers found in a research lab around the world. Okay, a spectrometer measures the wavelength and also frequency sign of light. It allows us to identify, analyze the atom in a sample we find within. In their simplest form, your spectrometer act as your sophisticated form of diffraction, somewhat like uh, the when you play of uh, the play of light that occurs when a white light hits a tiny bit of your DVD on a compact disc. Okay, the light is passed through the source, which has been made in the case through heating 
tour diffracting grating. We match like an artificial one polar line and onto a mirror as the light emitted by the original source is characteristic in a atomic composure. In diffracting and mirroring the first disappearances, then reflects the wavelength into the format that you can detect and quantify. Here you have here the video of your spectrometers and some pro uh, problems in illustration in sa nga spectrometer. So let's play this one. As we have learned in this tutorial, kinetics is the study of reaction rates. Sometimes we will want to know how quickly or slowly a chemical reaction will happen. Therefore, any kinetic study will require monitoring the concentrations of a particular reactant or product over time to see how quickly they are being used up or formed. Of course, we can't see molecules and count them. They are just too small and too many. So to do this, we have to be clever. We can measure the mass of a precipitate as it is forming, or we can measure the volume or even the pressure of a gas that is produced over time. But what if a reaction does not produce a product in a different phase than the solution? Luckily, one of the most reliable methods involves using spectroscopy, which is the study of how light interacts with matter. So let's learn about this technique now. All molecules absorb and emit light differently based on what kinds of covalent bonds are in the molecule. If the products and reactants interact with light differently enough that there is a color change as the reaction occurs, we can monitor this process with an instrument called a spectrophotometer in order to measure changing concentrations. This will give us data in the form of an absorption spectrum, which displays how much light through a band of frequencies is able to pass through a sample to reach the detector. Where there are peaks, it means that not as much of the light of that wavelength is getting to the detector, which means that it is being absorbed by the sample. If we collect data like this continuously over the duration of a chemical reaction, we can gather information about how rapidly the absorbance changes and thus how the concentration of a particular substance is changing over time. In order to do this, we will use an equation that relates the amount of material in a sample to the absorption of light passing through it, and this is called Beer's Law. Here, a is for absorbance. This symbol represents something called the molar absorptivity, a measure of how well a chemical species absorbs a given wavelength of light. B represents the path length, or the distance light has to travel through the sample, which is relevant because the more of a substance the light travels through, the more of it that will be absorbed. And C is the concentration of the sample, which again is relevant because because the more concentrated, the more absorbance that will occur. Absorbance is measured by comparing the intensity of the beam of light as it enters the sample and the intensity as it leaves the sample and strikes the detector, which are I0 and I respectively. And A will be equal to the log of I0 over I, or equivalently the negative log of I over I0. We can use this if we plug the latter version into the original in equation substituting for A and, and then solve for I, we can get this that version of the law, which displays the exponential relationship between variables that are we'll easily measurable. The primary advantage of this technique is that we can just let a reaction occur normally and measure the rate indirectly by analyzing the light that interacts with the components in solution rather than stopping the reaction and measuring concentrations directly. Let's try one calculation to put this into context. Say that a substance has a molar absorptivity of 0.35 inverse centimeters inverse molarity. Light passes through a 2 centimeter sample and hits the detector with an intensity of 0.12 compared with the incident B. What is the concentration of the sample? If we want to use the more basic version of Beer's Law, 
then first we need to calculate the absorption. We can use this simple equation from before, plugging in 1 for the initial intensity and 0.12 for the other intensity. That gives us 0.9208 for A. Then we will use Beer's Law. We can rearrange to solve for C, our unknown, plug in the absorption we calculated plus the two given values, and we should get around 1.3 molar for the concentration of the analyte. Gathering this kind of information regarding concentration and plotting it in real time using computer software will allow us to easily infer all kinds of things about the rate law and hence the reaction mechanism for the reaction that is happening in solution, which is incredibly useful data. To get just a bit more practice, let's check comprehension. Continuing, uh, continuing on, so why all, all of this quantitative analysis is important? It is important to know that your quantity of all parts say mga sample for several reasons. Okay, it is performing your chemical reactions. Your quantitative analysis helps you predict how much product to expect and also determine your actual nga yield. Some reactions take place when the concentration of one component reaches a critical level. For example, an analysis of a radioactive material might indicate there is enough of a key component for that specimen to undergo spontaneous fusion. Also, your quantitative analysis is crucial to the formation and testing of food and drugs. It is used to measure the nutrient level and provide an accurate accounting of your dosages and it is a critical in determining the level of contaminants or the impurities of your sample while the quantitative analysis might be able to determine the precise uh, a precise presence of a lead in a paint or a toy for example the quantitative analysis detects how much concentration exists your quantitative tests are used to verify the products met your manufacturer or regulatory specifications for medical test naman your class okay relies on your quantitative analysis for information about your patient's health for example the quantitative analysis technique that can determine your blood cholesterol okay, levels of the ratio sang mga lipoproteins in your plasma or the amount of your protein excreted sa aton nga mga urine okay here again your quantitative analysis complements your quantitative your quantitative, okay, the bat is quantitative, the measurement of the exact amount, okay, complements your qualitative, which uh, is more lang siya sa presence or detecting if the analyte is available or not, or if it is ara ba kung wala. Since the latter identifies the nature of your chemical, while the former, okay, tells you how much there is, while quantitative analysis part determine the exact total yield. Hence, it is important when examining. So, that uh, would be all sa ito chapter 7. And we will have our last discussion sa ito module 8. Okay. So, God bless you all and stay safe always.